Rashid. It went well. How are uh, Hey, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Let Us Reason. Uh, I'm Al Fadi, and with me here, my dear brother Sam Shamon, and we're talking about the interview with Rashid. I think it went very well, brother. Oh, okay. um, Sorry. I didn't know you about. went live yet, but hey, I just was curious because I didn't get to listen to it. And I want to hear it from uh, two theological giants who used to be Muslims, both of you, right? Oh, man, I appreciate hey. you, brother. Uh, we're no <laughs> giants at all. So uh, thank you, brother, uh, again, for being with us uh, for uh, yeah. another live stream. And uh, I've announced today, by the way, Sam, to the people that we will be talking about Bible translations. And I intentionally said, you know, which Bible to read or not to read, that's the question. But I want to clarify, you know, we have no intention whatsoever, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, to try to promote one translation over the other, one movement over the other. That's not what we are about no. today. We only want to show you the benefit, really, of having multiple Bible translations if you want to do a deep dive sometimes <laughs> into certain passages. And that's yeah. where we're coming from. And the reason what, what inspired me to uh, think about it this way is I was listening to Sam the other day on his live stream, and he really made a compelling argument uh, uh, from a, a certain passage in Genesis about why sometimes looking at a specific translation can be very helpful over, for instance, using a different translation. And I'll let Sam, of course, unpack that. So brother, that's <laughs> where we at today. That's why we yes, chose yes, this topic. Yes, yes. And I want to turn it over to you. Yeah, just guys, keep me in prayer. I'm not getting younger. I'm going to be 48, God willing, September, but I'm feeling my age. When I was a little younger, I could speak, let's say, nine hours, and my voice be good. Now, <clears throat> my voice cracks up. So pray, guys, if the Lord is pleased. He wants to keep me around for a little longer to keep me healthy enough for his glory. So we love you, Father. Son of God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Please, Holy Spirit, bless this session. Bless al and myself. Save us from error to speak the words you want us to speak, to glorify Jesus and give us the health we need, especially our <clears throat> lungs, our chest and our throat, to use our voice to glorify Jesus and sweeten our voice in the ears of your servants. In Jesus' name, Father, Amen. Son, and Spirit, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So everybody, this will be live streamed at uh, uh, Sierra International uh, uh, YouTube channel and also on my Facebook page, alfadi.sierra. In case you run into issues, you can always go back and forth and then Sam later will have access to it. All right, brother. If go you ahead. Want, I'm on your YouTube page, so you keep an eye on the Facebook page, right? Yeah, I'll do so that. Because what it is, is like, so I just finished my live stream and some of the folks from my live stream are here. God bless you. Good to see you. And they're telling me how are the walls doing? Because I don't know if you know Alfadi. <clears throat> because I'm stuck because of COVID-19 in my yeah. apartment. Yeah. I'm starting to have conversations with my walls. That is amazing, bro. Yeah, man. We have Which some way? sweet conversations. You know why? <laughs> Do you know why, brother, we have some sweet conversations? Well, well, yeah, please help us out here. Because they always agree with me I'm right. They don't debate me. Oh, absolutely. They will agree with everything you're saying. That's Just for right sure. <clears throat> Now, with that said about the translations, and <clears throat> I've said this on my own channel, and I'll say it again, I'm not here <clears throat> to convince people to believe like me, to think like me. And I honestly mean that. What I want, and Al Fadi wants the same thing, we want the Holy Spirit to use us, <clears throat> to sanctify us, to perfect us, to guide us in all truth, and to give us the grace to speak the truth. And then I'm trusting the Holy Spirit will then move you to take what we have to say and prayerfully go over it. Don't just accept it and ask the Holy Spirit to show you where we're wrong Amen. Amen. and where we're wrong to reject it and ask the Spirit in his mercy to show us where we're wrong to correct ourselves because we want to know the truth. Yes, we sir. want to affirm the truth, live the truth, and love the truth in the power of the Holy Spirit because our God is truth. So if you love God, you're going to love truth in Jesus' name. Now, Amen. it is important. Amen. It is important as Christians, to make sure you have an accurate translation. And we were just talking before we went live that you have different translations that are based on different translation principles, meaning <clears throat> some translations are more literal, others <clears throat> are more of a paraphrase, and some are in between. Now, Correct. the technical terms, and Al Fadi knows this because Al Fadi studied this, and I don't just say it in front of him. God has blessed this man. He brought him out of Islam and Ever, ever since he fell in love with Jesus, he's been intentional to know his faith. And glory to God, God has blessed them with knowledge, wisdom, and love for Jesus. May the Holy Spirit increase it in him, in his family, and all of us for the glory Thank of Jesus. Thank so you, some brother. of these terms, he knows already. You have what's called a formal equivalent translation. And you have something called a dynamic equivalent translation. These are just fancy terms that Christians come up with to sound intelligent. Right? <clears throat> but 
<laughs> All joking aside, a formal equivalent translation basically is a translation that tries to be literal. A dynamic equivalent translation is a translation that at times may give you a paraphrase as opposed to trying to be literal because one thing translation translations are not, they're not word for word translations. And I wanna make a distinction between a literal translation and a word for word translation. Word for word is where you try to take every word in an original language and find its equivalent in a target language. Now that doesn't work because there are certain expressions certain <clears throat> idiomatic phrases that only work in one language, not another. So Correct. what does a literal translation try to do? It's not going to give you word for word. It's going to try to be as close as to what the original says in a target language. And sometimes it may be word for word. Sometimes it may be a paraphrase. So there is no translation that's absolutely 100% word for word. You have translations that try to be as literal as possible and other translations that are more of a paraphrase because they want to give you meaning as opposed to simply getting as close to the original as possible. Now, a good example of a literal translation. ESV would be a formal equivalent <clears throat> translation as far as I know. ESV. New American Standard Bible. New King James Version. <clears throat> right. The King James Version. Now, a translation that would be a paraphrase and in my estimation a very bad one is the Message Bible. Right. Now you have translations that try to be balanced in between a literal translation and a dynamic or paraphrase. That's the NIV, New International Version. So <clears throat> what I want to talk about is the advantages of making sure that you're reading a translation that is faithful to what the originals say, and at the same time, a translation that you understand that will help you to grow in your love of God, in your understanding of God's nature, God's will for your life, so that you can know God as he is, fall in love with the true God, and then by the power of the Holy Spirit, carry out his will. Because what did our Lord say? Our Lord says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Jesus says, you want eternal life? you got to come to know the Father and the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit, and not just know intellectually, mental ascent. Know him in an intimate relationship. Amen. The word know that our Lord is using is similar to when you have Matthew 125, where it says, and Joseph did not know Mary until she gave birth to her son. Know there means to know someone intimately. Now, it can also mean know someone intimately through sexual union between husband and wife, the only relationship that God accepts. But in case of knowing God, it's not knowing him God forbid, sexually, but knowing him intimately, having a relationship with him, <clears throat> falling in love with him, Amen. speaking with him as, as your father <clears throat> and as your brother in Christ and as your friend, right? And coming to him with your concerns and coming to him with your needs and, and just telling him how much you love him and, <clears throat> and adore him. And then him speaking to you. Now, how does God speak to you? In the Bible. The Bible is God's voice. Insofar, the translation accurately <clears throat> renders what God said in the original languages. Now, for those who don't know, when it comes to the Old Testament, the original language <clears throat> is Hebrew and parts of it in Aramaic. For example, there are certain chapters in Ezra that are in Aramaic. And in the book of Daniel, if you read from chapter 2 all the way to 7, that's in Aramaic. And then you have some verses that have Aramaic, like Jeremiah 10, 11, that's in Aramaic. Psalm 2, 12 says, kiss the sun, Nashkubat, that's Aramaic. So Old Testament, primarily Hebrew, parts of it in Aramaic. When it comes to the New Testament, it's written in what's known as Koine Greek, the common Greek spoken by the common person at the that's time correct. of Christ. That's so correct. when you have a translation that translates those languages accurately, then you have the voice of God. Then God is speaking to you. So fall in love with his voice, cling to his voice, be enslaved to his voice, Obey his voice. And where do you find God's voice? The Bible. Now, that doesn't mean God doesn't speak to you in dreams and visions or speaks to you through the mouths of his servants. God can speak to you through the testimony of Christians where you ask God for something and either you get the answer from the Bible or God will send two or three witnesses, believers, even unbelievers, 
to then answer what you ask God unbeknownst to them. So God can speak that way and he can speak in dreams and visions. But if you want to know where God certainly speaks, definitely you're hearing from God. That's the Bible provided it's translated <clears throat> correctly. Now, with that said, my own conviction, this is my conviction. I'm not trying to sell you on it. After many years of meditation and reflection, I have come to the conclusion that for me, I believe that the King James Bible is God's perfect words in English, but I'm not trying to make you King James only. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I have my reasons. But what I do want to encourage you is, even if you don't follow the King James, and even if the King James is hard for you to understand, because maybe English is not your first language, you still should have a King James because it has advantages that other translations do not have that are not written in what we call Shakespearean English. And that's what I want to focus on. So again, let me repeat, and I'm saying this with all sincerity and integrity. I'm not here to make you believe what I believe or to follow the translation that I follow. Because even though I just said that about the King James and my conviction, it's the perfect words of God in English, I still consult modern English version, new King James version, because I'm at a point in my understanding that what is known as the Byzantine textual tradition, the Byzantine text type, also known as the majority text, which you have some Reformed Christians calling the ecclesiastical text, those family of manuscripts, those Greek <clears throat> manuscripts of the New Testament books, in my estimation, are vastly superior because they are the majority of our Greek witnesses and have a higher degree of uniformity. And I believe the original wordings of the original autographs are preserved there. That's my conviction. You have other men who are scholars, and I can't hold the candlestick to, that believe differently. But that's the beauty of our faith. You have a variety of voices who give you a variety of opinions, and they'll give you their evidences for you to weigh, investigate, <clears throat> study, and seek the face of the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. But Amen. whatever position you land on, even if you believe in what's known as reason eclecticism, and we can get into the definition later, where you believe that translations that are based on earlier papyrus or papyri, plural, which are closer to the originals. And it's not just that they're closer, but <clears throat> there are various rules of textual criticism that are applied to determine whether this reading is superior and closer to the original. Whatever it is, if you believe that you need to look at the earlier papyri and then weigh the manuscripts and take those into consideration and that the Alexandrian stream, which is another term used for a certain family of Greek witnesses, that happens to be superior because it's closer to the original, which means you'd prefer translations like English Standard Version, New American Standard Bible, Christian Standard Bible, <clears throat> New International Version. Even if you believe that, you still need a King James in your library because unless you can read the original languages, you will be losing a lot reading translations that are based on modern English. And we're going to look at a few examples. So before I move any further, do you have any comments or questions? I just want to make sure we clarify, and, and I know you know this, of course, Sam, uh, some Muslims, as you know, always accuse us of having different Bibles when they look at the different translations. That's not what we are talking about. Sam is not saying this yes. is the only Bible and ignore the rest of them. That's exactly. not what Sam is stating here. Yes, brother, go ahead. Yeah, now I just want to, Aaron Larson, no, New King James Version is based on the majority text. The King James is based on the received text, Textus Receptus, which is a small subset of the majority text, right? So, yes, it comes out of that same family, but the King James <clears throat> was based on the Textus Receptus. But not only that, it also looked into versions like the Latin Vulgate, which is why, Aaron Larson, you ask a good question. This is why if you go to Isaiah 14, 12, and the King James didn't start this. The translations before the King James also rendered a specific Hebrew term. And guys, don't take my word for it. In Isaiah 14, 12, you'll see there's an expression. It's Helel ben Shachar. Helel ben Shachar. The King James translates that Hebrew Helel as Lucifer. Well, that's from Latin. And the King James didn't invent that. The translations before the King James also took into consideration the Latin. Why? Because don't forget, folks, little church history is important. And by no means, I'm not trying to pass myself off as an expert. I'm a student of the experts. If you want experts, Aaron, James, <clears throat> James E. Snap, you'll find him on YouTube, James E. Snap, S-N-A-P-P. And on Facebook, he's an excellent New Testament textual critic. He does some superb work and he balances the scholarly opinion, because most scholars in the field of New Testament textual criticism 
are biased towards the Alexandrian stream and prioritize the earlier papyri, whereas James <clears throat> Snap, he looks into <clears throat> not just the earlier Alexandrian stream, but he also looks into the manuscripts and he also focuses on what we'd call the majority text, though he's not majority text, he's not majority text advocate or uh, Alexandrian advocate, he's still an expert and he gives you the other side of the story that you may not hear from those who prioritize the Alexandrian stream. I know I'm saying a lot of stuff and I'm throwing stuff out there, but look James E. Snap, look him up on Facebook, on YouTube, he's excellent and he's produced some of the best defenses for the longer ending of Mark, Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. And the woman caught in adultery, John 7, verses 53 to 811, being genuine scripture that Mark and John wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Some excellent defenses and responses to those who would argue otherwise. And another brother who is also excellent when it comes to the majority text position, which Reformed Calvinists would call the ecclesiastical text position, is Jonathan Sheffield. He too has a YouTube channel, Jonathan. He's Sheffield. amazing, and I'm bringing Jonathan, by the way, Good. here on live stream. Absolutely, yeah. He's an expert on that, and he's on Facebook. So go to them. Don't just read or listen to Daniel Wallace or others. Not saying don't listen to them. Listen to them, but you have to hear these other opinions and get a balanced view to see where the evidence lies and trust the Spirit to guide you into all truth. Amen. Now coming back to the issue. Go ahead, brother. You want, you want to take a question uh, from someone, or should we What's wait until question? later? What's the question? Ult ultimate truth, uh, who's also the known as the, as the ultimate distractor. You know, I'll just put the question right here for you to think about it. We, we can address it later. He's talking about John 8, 12. And he's saying uh, why, uh, I guess he's talking about translation. Why would the translation now say something that apparently wasn't saying before? I guess that's the gist of what he's saying. What Obviously, you know, we know the ultimate yeah. truth doesn't know the truth at all. He's just here for distraction anyway. But brother, listen, this guy has brought up the same objection on David of Wood's course. channel. Of and course. He brought on mine. We've refuted this silly nonsense course, over and over again. Now, course. let me let me adjust it for the benefit of the Christians here. He just quoted the Aramaic Bible in plain English, is it? Because I know that's available on BibleHub.com. I think it's the Aramaic Bible in plain English. Uh, could you post that? What what was that that he just posted? Because he was going uh, to Johnny. A question. Here it is. You can look yeah, at it right it, here. This is from because I know there is an English translation of the New Testament from Aramaic, right? So this particular right. translation, this is the English translation of the Aramaic New Testament, right? And I believe it's called the Aramaic Bible in plain English, right? And it's on BibleHub.com. They have it there. I know it's Aramaic, but the exact title slips my mind. Forgive me for that, but you'll find it. There, you'll find that they return, return, uh, return. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, uh, English is not my mother tongue, neither is Syrian. I don't speak any language. But anyway, and they re routinely, routinely render the, uh, the Greek, ego aimi. In Aramaic, it would be anewin or... Again, because in Hebrew, it's Anihu, Aramaic would be Anihu. But again, because this is Aramaic, don't quote me on this. I'm assuming if it's been translated in Aramaic in subsequent centuries, it's either Anihuin or it can even be Anihu. Either way, the reason why they translate what in Greek is Ego Aimi, right. Ego Aimi, that's the Greek. But remember, this is not based on the Greek. This is coming from the English translation of the Aramaic, which is found on BibleHub.com. Okay. The reason why they rendered I am the living God is because when our Lord Jesus uses that phrase, which in Greek is ego eimi, which in Aramaic would be anihu, but I don't know if because this is a translation that was done later in Aramaic or Syriac, because the Gospels were translated in Aramaic later on, if it would be anewin. And I'm looking, and I'm looking at the Greek, and it's ego ami. I mean, yeah, it's but very that's, remember, this is not from the Greek. That's right. That's right. He's quoting from the English translation of the Aramaic. That's because why I he has be an careful. agenda. That's yeah. why. But I'm going to turn this agenda and expose Muhammad as a son of Satan and Antichrist, which he is. Okay. Here's how I'm going to do it. Okay. Why do they translate it as "I am the living God"? Because the expression ego ami, which in the Old Testament would either be an anokihu, anokihu, or anihu, 
the way it's used in the context becomes a name for God, a description of God. You'll find that in the Hebrew Old Testament in Deuteronomy 32, 39, not Exodus 3, 14. See, this is where people thought I was going to go. Not Exodus 3, 14. In Deuteronomy 32, 39, as well as in Isaiah 41, verse 4, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, I, I pray I recall these passages correctly. Isaiah 41, verse 4. <clears throat> Isaiah 46, verse 4, Isaiah 51, 12, and Isaiah 52, 6, just to name a few of the places, you'll see that there God speaks of himself as the I am, That's which right. in Hebrew is either anihu or anochihu, and at times you'll find it where in the Greek translation of these verses, when they translate in Greek, you'll find some of these verses rendered as egoimi, 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 Literally means I am the I am. I am the I am. Now, because God uses that expression in context, <clears throat> which clearly function as a divine self-description, meaning as a way of God identifying himself as God. And then you find Jesus using that phrase, egoimi in Greek, anihu in Hebrew, or even in Aramaic, right? Because Jesus uses that phrase similarly to the way Yahweh, Jehovah used in the Old Testament, the translator of the Aramaic correctly reasoned that if Jesus is using this phrase in the same way that Yahweh, Jehovah does in the Old Testament, then clearly Jesus is using it to identify himself as God, which is why he rendered it as I'm the living God. This goes back to dynamic equivalent translation. And I hope you guys are listening. I'm not confusing you guys. So what you find there, he's not literally translating the words. He's translating the meaning. He's giving you a paraphrase. So like when Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. In the context, there he means he is the eternally existing God. Why? Because he's saying, unlike Abraham who was created and brought into being, I have always been and will always be. My existence is eternal. It transcends creation. Well, if that's what Jesus is saying, then he's claiming to be God. So this is a perfect paraphrase of the implication of Jesus' use of the words, but ultimate truth being an ultimate ummi, an ultimate stone kisser, would know this because he's following an illiterate, pedophile, woman-raping prophet. Sorry to be blunt, but that's what he's doing. Amen. So, brother, let's keep going because this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this Abdul is wasting our time right now. So yeah, let's keep going. And another guy is wasting our time. Wahadur Rahman. He, I, and I, I met some... Honestly, I say this with all due respect. I've met some stupid Muslims, but these guys take the cake. He actually thinks that Surat Al-Ikhlas, chapter 112 of the Quran, teaches pure monotheism. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and yet, you and I both know. So you're laughing because chapter 112 is one of the most incoherent, unintelligible <clears throat> babble ever produced by anyone, which makes sense because Muhammad was an incoherent, unintelligible, illiterate, pagan stone smoocher and he was don't get offended muslims he used to stone smooch the black stone like a good pagan because you and i both know that till this day you'll find debate what did allah mean when he said samad allahu samad look at tabari tabari gives you a plethora of different views regarding what did allah mean when he said he was samad not only that even the expression ahad you and i both know that grammatically ahad is incorrect because grammatically, in that sentence, to say Ahad means Allah is one of. One exactly. Of what? One, of, one of other gods, obviously. And you know what's so funny, Sam? Uh, Wahidur Rahman, translated literally, now that we enter the literal translation, yes. means the only begotten one of God. Wow. You're right. I wonder if he is going to basically promote himself as the son of God now. That's right. Yeah. So you see, these are. this is what happens when you follow a demonized false prophet blindly you end up shaming yourself humiliating yourself because the bible says if anyone dares to add to the words of god his true words or take away god will expose you as a liar and shame you proverbs chapter 30 verses 5 to 6 the bible is god's word the quran is the book of satan produced by an antichrist the son of satan like right now again look what he just said 
He says, Joseph was nine years old when he married Mary at nine. I mean, what do you do with such wicked, blasphemous pig? And I'm sorry, I don't mean to insult pig. But anyway, let the mods take care of them and bounce them, do whatever, send them to Mecca. But let's focus on the topic for let's the glory it. of Jesus Christ. By let's the way, I'm a little it. jealous. In my live stream, we got about 280. You're up to 300. Why is hey, that? Brother, are you because, you, me, because man? you are with us, brother. That's why we're getting 300. I mean, you're, you're why are you? Cry, bro. Um, well, I, I, I have a uh, tissue here. I'll send it to you by mail. Yeah, cry me a river. Okay, now, guys, let's focus. Let's refocus on translation. Why? Whatever your belief is regarding the transmission of the New Testament and which line of <laughs> transmission you accept, do not discard the King James. Have it with you and consult it because it has an advantage. Let's talk about some of the advantages. Here's okay. the advantage of the King James. The King James will help you distinguish whether a particular verse is addressing one or two or more. Let me repeat again. Uh -huh. Whether the context is addressing one or two or more. Pay attention to this, folks. Ignore the trolls, the sons of Satan. May the Lord deal with them, either showing them mercy, leading to repentance, or silence them for his glory. I want you guys to learn. This is about your Bible. Okay. Here's the advantage of a King James. When the King James wants you to know it's speaking of one, it will use TH. What do I mean TH? It will use the pronouns thou, thine, thy, thee. Now, when the King James wants you to know it's addressing two or, two, uh, two or more, as Holy Spirit blesses us to speak truth clearly, it will use Y, meaning it will use the pronouns ye, you, your. Ye, you, your. Now, most translations will translate the pronoun as you. So when you see the word you, Y-O-U, you don't know if it's referring to one or two or more. Not in the King James or any translation that was written in what we call Shakespearean English, like even the Geneva Bible or the Wycliffe, even the Dewey Rames, which is the English translation of the Latin Vulgate, a Catholic translation, right? Now, let me show you why. This will illuminate your understanding of Scripture and open up a door to a depth of, of understanding and wisdom because of these linguistic features. Unless you can read the original languages. Now, if you can read the original languages, then it doesn't matter what the English says. You can go through the original and see. But if you don't know how to read, write Hebrew, Aramaic, or Koine Greek, uh -huh. this will help you get the most out of your Bible. So if you're ready, we can give some examples. Let me repeat, though. Let me repeat again. Anytime you see in a translation, meaning the King James translation, the pronouns that start with TH, thou, thine, thee, thy, it means one. Now, sometimes it may, it may mean a collective one, an entire group <clears throat> in a collective whole, referring to a whole group as one, like one nation. Now, when the, the, the language is referring to two or more, in the King James, it will signify that to you by using the Y pronouns. You, ye, and your. So everyone got that, right? When it's one, it's thou, thine, thee, thy. When it's two or more, it's you, ye, and your. Now, you know, you already know this, right, brother? Amen. Okay, now, let's we'll see how this will help us. I want you to go to Genesis 2, 15 and 17. And let's unpack the implication of this because I don't know how much time we have. Now, guys, I'm jealous. Tomorrow, God willing, when I live stream, I want over 300. He's got 303. I'm jealous. I'm better looking than him. But anyway, that's it. You know, I'm better looking than you, man. Come on. Don't hate. That, that's why I'm wearing a jacket, because I want to distinguish myself from you. That's why. So. Okay, now. okay, so you want us to go to Genesis 2? Yeah, Genesis 2, 15, 17. Notice the advantage of a King James. Even if you don't believe it's the best translation, you still need to consult it. And here's why. Remember what I said. Don't forget this. When the, the Bible is speaking to one, the King James will reflect that by translating the pronouns as thou, thine, thy, thee. When it's two or more, it'll use you, ye, your. You, ye, your. Now let's see that. Genesis 2, 15 and 17. Okay, so in uh, I'm going to read from King James, uh, verse 15, Genesis 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Let's go to verse 16. No, 15 and 17. Keep reading. In verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. 
Now read it one more time. Read it 16 one more time. Pay attention to the pronouns. And the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. Thou, notice the pronouns thou, pronoun is thou. Keep reading. And in verse 17, it says, but of the three of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shall not eat of it. For in the day that thou eats thereof, thou shall surely die. So notice it's thou. So he's talking to one person, right? Exactly. Thou shall not eat because in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. So notice it's TH. Why? Because there's only one human person. He's only talking to Adam. So, and now notice that the King James captures it perfectly because the pronouns are TH. And anytime you see TH, thou, thy, thine, thee, it's one person. But now notice how the pronouns change in Genesis 3. Pay attention, folks. Now notice how the pronouns change in Genesis 3. And now I want to see if you guys see the difference. In Genesis 3, we're going to read verses 1 to 5. 1 to 5. Okay. We're going to go there now, and I'm going to, you know, basically read it for you. So Genesis 3, verses 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree okay. of the garden? On my part, your sound was breaking up. Read that one more time. What did the serpent say to the woman? Yea, yea means like, Shh, yeah. really? All right, but, yeah. Yeah, but read it again. Because yeah. you're, you're okay, so now breaking. the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. Mm -hmm. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did you see the pronoun change, guys? Pay attention. When the serpent's speaking, he said, As God said, ye shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Notice the pronoun is ye, ye. Now, that means that in the original language, in Hebrew, Satan is now addressing more than one person. Guys, and pay that's, attention. That's important, by the way. Even in the Arabic is important. Yes. Now, pay attention again why this is important. The serpent, though speaking to Eve, He's not just addressing her. He's now addressing the Eve and someone else. How do we know? Because when he says, has God, God said, ye shall not surely eat of any tree. Ye meaning not just you, someone else. God told you and someone else because it's plural. Anytime you see the words ye, you, your, it's plural, two or more. Now continue reading. Verse 2. Again, we're in Genesis 3, verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Did you notice the response? It's plural. We may eat. We. That's she right. didn't say I may eat. So exactly. folks, you understand? The conversation is, though the servant's talking to Eve, he's of talking to her and someone else. He's addressing not just Eve, but someone else as he's talking to Eve. So he's including someone else in what God said to them. And Eve responds accordingly saying, we may eat. Well, Eve, why are you referring to the we? I thought he's just talking to you. No, though he's talking to Eve, he's not just referring to her alone. He's referring to someone else that's with her. So she responds, we may eat. Now pick it up from there again. Verse uh, three. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now notice the difference when God said to Adam, he goes, thou shall not eat of it because in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt die. But here when Eve is recalling the words of God, she says, God said, ye shall not eat of it because in the day that ye eat, ye shall surely die. The ye is now two or more. How is it that in Genesis 2, when God gave these instructions, he used the pronouns that refer to one person. Thou shall not eat. Thou eatest, thou will die. But then when Eve is recalling God's instructions, it's now two or more, which is why she says, God said, ye shall not eat, because in the day ye eat, ye shall surely die. Why the change? Now, my brother, why the change? Why? When God is speaking to Adam, you have the TH pronouns, meaning God is speaking to one. Thou shall not eat. Thou eatest, thou shall die. But now Eve, when she's now recalling God's instructions, 
the pronouns change from one to two or more. God said, ye shall not eat, because in the day ye eat, ye shall surely die. Why did it change? It's you clearly that the, the instruction is wasn't just to Adam. It was to Adam, to uh, Eve, and I would argue to even to their descendants as well, 100%. if you put it in context. So, folks, did you see the advantage of the King James in that if you go with just the modern version and modern English, you won't see these intricate nuances that help you go much deeper into the language of the Bible because modern English lacks that capacity unless you add a qualifier to the pronoun. But in the King James, anytime, guys, from now on, pay attention and prove me wrong. Anytime when the context is referring to one, the pronouns will be thou, thine, thee, thy. If it's two or more, ye, your, <clears throat> and you. So understand the implication of Genesis 3 before we move on. Here, the serpent, though talking to Eve, he's not just talking to her, but he's talking to her and Adam. This is the implication. Let's unpack the meat. So the serpent approaches Eve and Adam is there. Well, how do we know he's there? Because the pronouns are plural, meaning two or more. So he's now talking to Eve and Adam when he's talking to Eve. So Adam is there. And now who's speaking on behalf of the couple? Eve is. Eve is now talking to the serpent. And she's telling the serpent what God told her and Adam. So she's now speaking on behalf of Adam, representing Adam in this conversation. And this is why all hell breaks loose. But I'll get to that in a minute. Continue reading all the way to five. <clears throat> All right, so uh, verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. There goes verse that pronoun ye again. Ye meaning more than one. Ye shall yeah. not surely die. Right. And verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Your and eyes, eat. not thine eyes that your eyes exactly. shall be open now finish that part your eyes shall be open and what and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil so now folks if you saw the difference in the pronouns serpent says ye shall not die because in the day that ye ate your eyes will be open remember the y in the king james your ye right you means two or more in other words the serpent is telling Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, you guys won't die. But your eyes, the eyes of both of you will open up and both of you will be like God. That's what he said. He was talking to Adam and Eve. Folks, you know what that means? Adam was right there <clears throat> listening to the conversation between the serpent and Eve. But he was there as a passive bystander instead of, getting involved in the conversation, stepping in and stopping the serpent from addressing his wife. You understand the implication of Genesis 3? Now let's unpack the meat. How much time we have? Because I want to look at a couple more examples uh, before we move we on. We still but... have at least uh, another 20 minutes at okay. least. Okay, glory to God. Now, now that you understand what's happening, here's what Genesis 3 is showing us. And I want all my brothers and sisters, especially the ladies, to hear this. What happened in Genesis 3 is... The serpent is addressing Eve in the presence of Adam. The serpent is getting Eve to question God's integrity and faithfulness in the presence of Adam. Adam is hearing the conversation, and instead of stepping in and stopping the serpent from addressing his wife and protecting her, he allows Eve to initiate and converse with the serpent and remains in the background and does nothing to silence the lies of the serpent and protect his wife. That's the sin of Adam. I don't Amen. know. Okay. Do you understand what the sin of Adam was? Adam, you are the head of Eve. You are her protector. You're called to protect her. Why are you allowing a serpent to engage conversation with her? Why aren't you stopping in, silencing the serpent, and defending the integrity of God, and preventing your wife from conversing with the serpent, and getting her to question God's integrity and your integrity? Why do you remain silent and let her take the lead and initiate when it's your role to protect her and silence the serpent from deceiving her? Because you know God said this. And instead of allowing her to doubt whether God said this to you and then through you to her, so she questions God's integrity and your integrity and conveying God's words, you step in, silence him, and protect your wife. 
That's where Adam failed. Adam Amen. failed not... to guard and shield and protect his wife. And brother, uh, correct me again if I'm wrong. I mean, I, I believe the way we explain you explained it right now makes even perfect sense why God, for instance, will say, Adam, Adam, where are you? As if God is saying, are you in the midst of this conversation that is taking place between Eve and, and uh, the servant? Were you aware of what was going on? Uh, and and I, I mean, I'm bringing this up, as you know, our friends always attack uh, the knowledge of God as if the God of Islam knows everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I want the Christians to understand it because the Muslim trolls are here trolling as agents of the devil. So the Lord deal with them. But for the Christian, you understand that one of the sins of Adam, if you now understand what's happening, Adam wasn't some somewhere else. He was there listening to the conversation. Where did he drop the ball? Instead of stepping to the forefront, silencing the serpent to protect Eve, he allowed Eve engage the serpent and the serpent to entice Eve and remain passive and silent this is where adam failed he failed as the head as the husband called to shield and protect his wife so adam failed in that role but notice that this is brought up clearly in the shakespearean language of the king james because of the difference in the pronouns when it's one the king james will signify it by using thou thine thee when it's two or more it will use you your ye so that's one example. Are we ready for another example? Yes, you. sir. Let's do it. Okay. Advantages of having a King James. So don't set it aside. Don't denigrate it. Don't look down upon it because I've noticed the tendency, and it's a tendency I had. When you listen to a certain type of scholarship and their criticism of King James, it turns you off from the King James to the point you don't even consider looking at it just for supplemental reading. In other words, as, as a translation helpful to the Bible you use to bring out these, <clears throat> these nuances that modern English failed to capture, right? Don't do that. Have it and use it and consult it with the translation you prefer because these are nuggets that you don't find in the modern translation. And here I'll give you another example. Genesis, I'm sorry, John chapter 3, verses 7 to 8. John chapter John 3, verses 7 to 8. Now, again, as you go to John 3, 7 to 8, guys, pay attention to the difference in the pronouns. Thou, thine, thee, thy, one. You, your, ye, two or more. Now, let's see if you guys catch it in John 3, verse 7 to 8, verse 7, 8, especially. Very good. So, for, uh, John 3, verse 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Okay, read it one more time. I'm going to have you read it twice. Guys, pay attention. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Notice what he says to Nicodemus. Read it two more times. John chapter 3, verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Marvel eight. not that I said to what? Read it one more time, brother. I like the things in three because I'm Trinitarian. Not a problem. Marvel not that I said unto thee. Ye must be born again. Okay, now, Al, help me help me understand what you read. Jesus said, marvel not, I said unto thee. That's one. I said to thee, T-H. Ye must be born again. But the Y-E means two or more. But the T-H-E-E, -E, thee, means one. Marvel not, I said to thee, ye must be born again. Did you catch that nuance? That though Jesus is talking directly to Nicodemus, marvel on, I said to thee, you specifically, ye must be born again. He's now saying, all of you present, listening to this conversation between me and Nicodemus, what I'm saying to him applies to all of you. Not only you, but all of them must be born again. Did you see Amen. that Amen. nuanced shade of meaning that's captured in the King James, but in modern translations, it may be lost because they typically render... The pronouns just as Y O U, whether it's one or two or more, you, your, right? But in the King James, you saw, marvel not, I said to thee, to you specifically, all of you must be born again. You see? Now read it all the way to eight, finish it, you'll see. Yeah, let me just uh, put somebody on timeout because he keeps wasting my time right now. So we'll go that, to verse. Asking me, as you do that, how do they know, Rima? Because in the original languages, in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, the pronouns, <clears throat> signify exactly. whether it's singular or two or more. This is a feature in almost every language. 
It was a feature of Old English, but it's lost in modern English. Ask any Greek speaker or Arabic speaker or even a Syrian speaker. In these languages, pronouns can either be singular or plural. It can even be dual. Like in Arabic, you have singular, dual, or plural, right? Absolutely. And I have to tell you, folks, I, as someone who speaks Arabic, which is a Semitic language, I even appreciated my Hebrew Bible even more. The fact that it has dual in it, singular, dual, and plural, because that's extremely important, folks, you know, especially in uh, theology, uh, because you need to know what is going on here, you know, and, and that's why uh, we're doing this show, by the way, to help you understand and appreciate the fact. Don't discount one dis uh, translation and say, oh, I don't want to look at it because my so-and-so told me. No, no. If you want to learn the word of God at a deeper level and you don't want to really look at the Greek and the Hebrew, translations can be extremely helpful. Yes. In, in other words, what we're saying is unless you have expertise and can read the Hebrew, Aramaic, Old Testament or the Greek New Testament fluently and understand, and there are people who can do it, so they don't need a translation. Your second best option is to pick up a translation that brings out these shades of meaning on a deeper level. And among English translation, the King James does it perfectly. And any translation that <clears throat> was based on what we call Shakespearean English, because there were English translations of the Bible before the King James, Geneva Bible, Wycliffe, and they have this feature where the pronouns are differentiated, whether it's one or two or more, by the TH or the Y. So in these translations, if it's one, thou, thy, thee, thy. If it's two or more, you, your, ye. Because the men who translated knew the original languages and knew, well, this pronoun is referring to one or as a, an entire group as one, or now it's addressing two or more, and they trans, transferred it over into Shakespearean English because Shakespearean English had that feature. Modern English lost that feature, which is why you have to then add some qualifier to the pronoun, like saying all of you. If you just say exactly. you, I tell you, right? Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you, you must be born again. Well, hold on. When you say, I tell you, you must be born again. Are you now still speaking Nicodemus or to the crowd? The only way modern English can help you is by adding a qualifier. I tell you, Nicodemus, all of you must be born again. So you got to add those additional words, all of you, right? But with the yeah. King James, you don't need to add these additional <clears throat> words to qualify. It's taken care of by the TH or the Y. Thou, thine, thee, thy, you, your, ye. Now let me give you... Another example. Are you ready for another example? Yeah. Yes. And let me answer. Nada, nada verse. Yes, please go ahead and ban him from the chat. Or as my dear brother will say, send him into his merry way. That's right. Send him back to Asheron. All right. All now, right, my friend. So what do you want Here's to read? Here's another example. Now, this one I love. Guys, this one you really need to pay attention to. This is one of the passages that you have our Christian brothers and sisters from either the Orthodox tradition or the Roman Catholic trad tradition. This is one of the passages they use to show Petrine primacy, that Peter was given authority over the apostles as their head. And there's some truth to that. Now, here we go. We have a guy named Homeless Sam Shimon. He's another rabi pedophile like Muhammad who's got nothing better to do but to attack me. Friend, if I'm homeless, that's okay. I have a mansion in heaven. But your prophet has a home in hell. He's burning in the pit of hell for being a wicked, filthy pedophile, woman raping, stone smoocher. Live with it. He's dead and buried. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Don't worry. We'll pause him for you. So no, I don't uh, care. I mean, they, it's like they think I'm going to cry. Oh, I'm homeless. <laughs> Remember what our Lord said. And I'm not worthy to kiss the sandals of my Lord Jesus. I'm not worthy to kiss the ground he walked on. He is my God. Jesus said, when someone said, I want to follow you, Matthew 8, 19 to 20. This is what our Lord said. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. If my Amen. Lord condescended to be so humble that he chose to live in such a way where he wasn't rich and didn't have a place to call his own, then who am I to have a mansion on earth when my God chose to live humbly? Whereas his wicked pedophile prophet murdered people, raped their women, even married women, and whored women, calling it muta, and then plundered them and was so rich 
that he had 11 wives and each of one of his wives had a home. So their prophet lived at large like a wicked, filthy pagan who's now burning in hell, whereas our Lord Jesus lived humbly and now rules all creation and owns everything. And if we follow him, we will rule and own everything with him. Thank you, Jesus. Come on now. Are you ready? Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Hallelujah, 42. brother. Here's now pay attention to this example, folks. A translation okay. captured perfectly in the King James that unless you add some qualifiers to the pronouns, you won't find in the other versions. Luke 22, 31 to 32. Luke 22, right. 31, 32. Okay. I am ready. Guys, pay attention to pronouns. Focus now, especially you Orthodox Catholic, you're going to love this one, especially you, Nada. Nada and Anna. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Verse 32. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Okay. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Pay attention again. Sorry, guys. Notice how the pronouns change. Pay attention to the pronouns. One more time. Luke 22, 31 to 32. One more time. Verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you. You. He, pronouns you. Ruth, right. Right, Why, right? Satan has desired to have you. To do what? That he may sift you as wheat. You. Notice, guys, Jesus talking to Peter, and he says, Peter, Satan has asked. To have you to sift you. Notice the why. And the King James why means two or more. But now notice the change of pronouns in verse 32. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Okay, now let me ask you a question, L. In verse 32, the pronouns went from you to I have prayed for thee. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Why did the pronouns change? First in 31 says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Asked for Sweet. you to sift you. But then in 32, but I prayed for thee. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Why the change in the pronouns? So obviously the in 30, uh, or the talk was to everybody the disciples in this case and then the lord is specifically speaking to peter here wow folks did you catch it in the king james this is what jesus said satan has asked us if all of the disciples but peter i prayed specifically for you i have prayed for thee and i prayed specifically that when you're restored you'll be given the responsibility of restoring your brethren did you catch it in the King James, you see what the original language says. Satan has asked for all of you, but I have prayed specifically for you, Peter. And because I pray, you will be restored. And when you're resp restored, you will be given responsibility of restoring your brethren. A powerful, powerful testimony. Now, let me unpack the meat. Let's go. I don't know how much time I have, but let me unpack some of the meat here. Okay. Brother, Remember? for you, for you, we will stay on the air for as long as you like, brother. Hallelujah. That means till midnight. But let me unpack the meat for all of you. Guys, understand. Number one, notice Satan must be given permission to come against the people of God. Don't forget what the Lord said. Satan has asked for you to sift you like we. Secondly, second point. Jesus is on earth. Pay attention now. How did our Lord know that Satan had asked to come against the disciples to test their faith when this would have been a heavenly scene? In other words, Satan would have to approach God in his heavenly court on his heavenly throne to get permission. But Jesus is on earth. And to prove that's where Satan would ask, don't take my word for it. Write these down. Job chapter 1. And by the way, guys, the sin, synecoc, He's an anti-Trinitarian heretic, a tool of the devil who comes here to distract. So if you want to ban him, send him on his merry way. He's not yes, sincere. He listen, listen, to, listen to Sam. He knows these guys uh, better than I do. So please yeah. send him in his merry way. Oh, yeah. yep. Another troll of the devil who's an anti-Trinitarian. Don't waste your time. Yeah, tell him, him. Tell yeah. him ye He's out there. of there. But ye, that means him and his, his family. Thou has been smitten, thy wicked one. Anyway, coming back to the issue. 
To prove to you that Satan has to ask God in heaven, write down Job 1 and read verses 6 to 22. And Job chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, it says that Satan came before God in heaven to be given permission to come against Job. So learn what Jesus is teaching you in a matter of two verses. Number one, Satan has to be given permission to come against the people of God. Number Amen. two, Jesus on earth knows what's happening in heaven. Because what did he say, Simon? He revealed to Simon what's taking place in heaven. Simon... As I am with you on earth physically, Satan has come to ask to then tempt you and test you to fall away, all of you. Lord, how do you know that? Here's how I know. Though I'm on earth because I'm human and I have a physical body and I'm on earth with you, I'm God. Jesus is saying, because I'm God, I'm present everywhere. So physically, in my body, I'm here. But as God, I fill all things and oversee everything so I know what's taking place in heaven, though I'm here physically in my body with you. Number three, notice Jesus intercedes for the people of God. Because notice what our Lord say in 32, Amen. but I Amen. pray for thee. And number four, those whom Jesus prays for, it's, a not, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Because notice what our Lord said, I prayed for you. When you are restored, notice what he did not say. He didn't say, if you'll be restored. Because I prayed for you, Peter, guaranteed you will be restored. Because those whom Jesus intercedes for are kept perfectly secure by the power of the triune God. Because for whomever Jesus prays, that person is sealed by the Spirit for the day of glory. Because all that the, the Son desires of the Father, he shall receive. How do I know that? Write down John 11. 41 and 42. John 11, 41 and 42, where our Lord says, Father, I thank thee, if the King James says thee, because he's speaking to one, I thank thee that you've heard me, but I knew you always hearest me. You always hear me. Notice what the Lord says. Anytime and every time I ask something of the Father, he hears me and gives me whatever I want because the Father is in love with me and he delights to give me all I ask, like I'm in love with the Father and delight to do whatever the Father desires of me. So if Jesus Amen. prays for you, take it to the bank. Guaranteed, you'll be sealed, secured, and kept safe forever and ever by the Holy Spirit. So notice what you Hallelujah. In two Hallelujah, verses, brother. though Satan comes against you, Jesus prays for you. And if Jesus prays for you, you are sealed by the blood of the Lamb, and kept secure by the Spirit. Hallelujah. What an amazing God we have, the triune God of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So I hope those examples Amen. suffice and you learn a little more about the work of the Trinity in preserving us for his glory and how Satan must lose and shall lose when he comes against us because he who is in us, because he who is in me and you, the Holy Spirit is greater than he who is in the world. And we shall never perish and no one will pluck us out of the hand of the father and the son as we are sealed by the spirit hallelujah 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 we love amen. you father amen <laughs> and folks do you see why i love this brother do you see how i myself get discipled by him how my faith was strengthened by his devotion really to and dedication to help me and my hope is that uh, you are benefiting from this as well and i'm going to keep bringing my dear brother here to do these deeper things you know we're not going to go to the surface. We expect you now to be deep into uh, the Word of God. And that's our hope, is that these kind of sessions will help you dig deeper into that. Brother, yeah. once again, for the benefit of those that I, I really would be surprised if somebody doesn't know who you are. But just in case, you never know. How can they follow you? And I saw that you have Super Chat. So I encourage everybody to pay for this, brother, even through the Super Chat. Okay? Go ahead, brother. Yeah. Now, again, you guys know, some of you may not know, I have my own YouTube channel, Shamunian, S-H-A-M-O-U-N-I-A-N. I try to live stream every day, and I have a blog that I write, articles and rebuttals, answering Islamblog.wordpress.com, and we, I also write for answeringislam.net. So go to my YouTube channel, subscribe, and join me on my live streams. I try to live stream daily, live streaming around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I'm a little jealous. We had about 280. We got 370 for this guy. I want the channel to increase for the glory of Jesus. I want to see 2,000 him, but I want the number coming to me. 
Let's do three three seventy for him, three seventy for me, and in we'll, Jesus' name, come we'll on, man. We'll, we'll, we'll negotiate, Sam. We'll negotiate. I'll have my agent talk to your agent. Right. You homeless do Sam Shamon. Do pray for my daughters that Jesus will bless them, love them, and secure them, and bring them to me because I love them. But Jesus loves them more. And pray for this brother. Pray for his family. God protect them and seal them and provide for them. Amen. We're in full time ministry, so we trust the grace of God working through the. To do this work until Jesus calls us home. Amen. We love you, Jesus. Amen. 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 So we, we, we have we have a guy. Uh, uh, the name is Lametna Lametna Allah Hadikum. Meaning he's asking God to guide us. We are guided. We are already guided. We okay. follow the truth. And here is what's so funny about these Muslims, by the way. Seventeen times a day they read Surah Al-Fatiha and they ask Allah to guide them. I thought they're guided. Well, they? it's worse than that. Christians, I'm going to let you in on a, on a secret. I did a session on this. I wrote an article. Do you know the Quran says that Allah himself is on a straight path? That Allah too is being guided? Let me prove it to you. I have an article on this on my blog, and I'm going to hey, give it to you Allah right is now. saved? Hey, Allah himself is Allah on is a straight saved? path. That's amazing. Uh, let me prove it to you that he's on a straight path. Guys, the Muslim God is on a straight path with Muslims because he needs to be to salvation. And if you don't believe me, you know where? Eleven. Verse 56 of the Quran, chapter 11, verse 56 of the Quran says, My Lord surely is on a straight path. My Lord surely is on a straight path. Wait, 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 wait. My Lord surely is on a straight path. What in the world is Allah doing on the straight path with Muslims when that's the path to salvation? Do you know why? Because even Allah himself needs Jesus to save him. Because Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So Muslims, Amen. your God is on a straight path and needs to be guided. Jesus is the straight path. He is the guidance to salvation. So our Jesus is better and greater than your Allah. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. So so Allah is saved. Uh, you know, Muhammad is too late for him. Uh, so we ask you Muslims who are listening to us, Follow the path of Allah who's following Jesus now. So Exactly. That means when Allah prays, uh, Al, he's praying to Jesus because the Quran says he prays. Now I figured out, Allah, who are you praying to? I'm praying to Jesus to guide me on the straight path to salvation because he is the straight path and he is the way. So I pray to Jesus. So Allah, who do you pray to when you pray for Muhammad? To Jesus who is greater than me and I'm under his feet. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen, brother. Well, thank you again. And uh, uh, once, one, one more time, brother. How can people go and subscribe? Yes. And Shemunian, support you also, please. Shemunian, please subscribe. And tomorrow, God willing, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I want to see about 400. I want his channel to increase, our, my channel increase, because we're giving you top-notch information to be used to glorify Christ. Shemunian, you can go to my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, and support us on Patreon or PayPal, uh, whatever God puts in your heart. But do pray for us, pray for our families, in my case, my daughters, that I will see them sooner than later, you know, because Amen, you know, brother. they need their Baba and them. So in Jesus' name. We love you, brother. Thank you so love much, you everyone. Too. And we'll see you soon on another live stream. Uh, God bless everybody. Take care.